All right, this is part four as we continue. Uh, section or part 48.4. Um, now getting into synapses. So we've talked about how the impulse travels down the axon, called an action potential. Now we have to communicate from cell to cell. So there's two types of synapses. There is an electrical synapse where the cells are directly connected uh, through a gap junction and ions essentially pass through the gap junction continuing the depolarization into the next cell. Um, for example, uh, neurons in, or uh, cardiac muscle cells are actually connected in such a fashion where the electrical messages pass from cell to cell making it very fast and very efficient um, and spreading almost like a net all the way through all those muscle cells. Um, but most of the synapses are chemical in nature where there's an actual gap and chemicals called neurotransmitters have to pass across. So here we see um, axon terminals uh, or synaptic terminals on a postsynaptic neuron and there's an actual space between each of these, between this giant ball and these little teeny tiny terminals uh, that we call a synaptic gap or a synapse uh, through which neurotransmitters will cross. So the impulse, here we have a presynaptic neuron and at the end of the presynaptic neuron we have um, vesicles and these vesicles contain neurotransmitters. Um, those neurotransmitters are only released when, as the action potential reaches the end of the synaptic terminal, calcium enters the cell, and that calcium triggers the binding of these vesicles with the membrane, and then exocytosis, releasing the neurotransmitters into the gap, the cleft, uh, which will then bind to receptors on the postsynaptic cell. Now these receptors are typically things like uh, sodium channels where when this um, neurotransmitter binds to the receptor, it causes an influx of sodium and then depolarization continues, uh, for example. There's different types of receptors for different neurotransmitters. Um, that's not important that you know. For this here, we need to know that calcium enters and causes fusion of the vesicles, uh, releasing neurotransmitters through exocytosis. Um, so, and here you see those receptors are ligand gated ion channels, those ion channels will open and it generates a postsynaptic potential, uh, a depolarization or even a hyperpolarization in the postsynaptic cell. Uh, for it to be a depolarization, of course, it would be an influx of sodium. For it to be a hyperpolarization, um, it would be an influx of potassium. Um, so neurotransmitter is going to diffuse out of the cleft and can also be taken up by surrounding cells and degraded and eliminated. We don't want the neurotransmitter to stay in the synapse for too long um, because then it'll continue to cause that um, potential, uh, the electrical potential to the postsynaptic cell. Uh, postsynaptic potentials are graded as opposed to action potentials. Remember action potentials were all or none. Postsynaptic potentials are graded uh, and they don't regenerate themselves. So we can have EPSPs or excitatory postsynaptic potentials or IPSPs, inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. Excitatory postsynaptic potentials essentially are going to depolarize the postsynaptic cell, make, moving it closer to threshold, easier to fire. And inhibitory postsynaptic potentials are going to hyperpolarize uh, the postsynaptic cell. And these can be combined. You can have 10 excitatory postsynaptic potentials from different synaptic um, terminals and two inhibitory postsynaptic potentials, all of them on the same um, dendrite, for example, and all of their effects will be summed and added together to produce the final outcome, if you like. So here, for example, we have an EPSP. This is too small to elicit an action potential because it doesn't reach threshold, followed by another EPSP, too small to elicit an action potential. But here we have temporal summation where if they are fired in quick succession or they arrive at the postsynaptic cell at approximately the same time, they'll get added or summed up together, meaning or making it strong enough to reach threshold and thus fire an action potential. Uh, this is called temporal summation. Uh, summation in regards to time, temporal is time. In spatial summation you have uh, multiple um, postsynaptic, multiple um, synaptic terminals uh, reaching the cell at the same time and as a result excited EPSP1 and EPSP2 occur at the same time creating a strong enough depolarization to reach threshold and thus fire an action potential. This is spatial summation. Now, an IPSP can also counter the effects of an EPSP. So here we have a different synaptic terminal um, sending a hyper, causing a hyperpolarization 
versus here an EPSP causing a depolarization. Here you have the EPSP, but uh, in quick succession you get an IPSP that takes it down below rest, and as a result you don't get any action potential firing. And all these are just different forms of summation. Um, sometimes we can get indirect synaptic transmission, whereby a neurotransmitter is going to bind to a receptor that's not part of an ion channel, and that causes internal changes in the postsynaptic cell. Uh, in the form of a signal transduction pathway using second messengers and so on. Now this is going to produce a much more slow developing and long lasting effect than what we saw with neurotransmitters binding to ligand gated ion channels. Um, now you can have the same neurotransmitter produce different uh, effects in different synapses in different parts of the body. Uh, one neurotransmitter can be both excitatory and inhibitory in one region of the brain for example it can cause an excitation, an EPSP, and in a different region of the brain it can cause inhibition or an IPSP. Depends on the location and the neurotransmitter. Here's some of the major ones. What I recommend for the AP test is to memorize one of these, one of the main ones, um, to understand uh, the name, what it, uh, is it excitatory or inhibitory or both, and then where it works. Just choose one and memorize. The ones I'd recommend uh, memorizing, uh, you can pick acetylcholine is the probably the most common one that we'll uh, ever see. It's involved in the neuromuscular junction, so where a neuron synapses with a muscle cell. And then the other ones you have norepinephrine, um, which is the kind of cousin to epinephrine. You have dopamine, this is the, um, the happiness neurotransmitter, if you like, in the pleasure center of the brain, generally excitatory. Uh, or serotonin, that's kind of the sleepiness one. High levels of serotonin makes you sleepy. Those are sort of the, the ones that I would focus your attention on. Here we have just brief description, uh, acetylcholine. It can be inhibitory or excitatory. It's excitatory in the skeletal muscle cells. Uh, and it's found both in vertebrates and in invertebrates, by the way. Uh, the others, epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. They're active in both CNS and PNS. Um, epinephrine and norepinephrine are excitatory in different ways. They're inhibitory in some regions, excitatory in others. Um, for example, um, epinephrine increases heart rate and increases blood pressure, but it uh, causes vasoconstriction and decrease of blood flow to the digestive system, for example. Um, all right, so divisions of the nervous system, we have the central nervous system. Um, brain and spinal cord, of course, and then you have the peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system is important for allowing the communication between the CNS and the outside environment, uh, and largely with movement and so on. And the PNS is divided into some subcategories. The somatic nervous system is what you normally think of with your skeletal muscles. These are voluntary. You have control over those. The autonomic nervous system is automatic, if you like. The autonomic nervous system happens on its own, and it's subdivided into two main ones that we talk about. Your book also describes an enteric division, which is the GI tract, but we largely, de largely describe two. The sympathetic division is uh, excitatory, um, and the parasympathetic division is inhibitory. Um, and they're activated in, in opposition to each other, essentially, but you don't have control over them. The somatic nervous system carries signals to skeletal muscles. Autonomic is involuntary, divided into sympathetic, parasympathetic, and enteric. Here you see all the different peripheral nerves that emanate out from the spinal cord. Um, when you go to medical school, you get to learn every single name and every single location between every vertebrae. Each one of these peripheral nerves comes out in, this, in the gap or the space between the vertebrae of your spine. Um, and you get to learn what it does and so on, which of course we won't do here. Um, now, sympathetic and parasympathetic, as I mentioned, one's excitatory, the sympathetic. Parasympathetic is typically inhibitory. Um, and they essentially oppose one another. Now, I shouldn't say that parasympathetic is always inhibitory. Again, quite often it'll stimulate digestion while uh, the sympathetic is going to inhibit digestion. So this is your typical fight or flight system where if you're walking down a path in Yosemite and a bear jumps out in the path and says, ha ha, um, your option is to fight the bear, which is probably not the best choice, or to run. And when you're running, you don't want to be working on digesting lunch. That's really not important. You can put that off later. You want all your blood flow going to your muscles to run faster um, and to not fatigue and so on. You don't want to be digesting things. You don't want to be sleeping and so on. And you really don't need to be peeing uh, 
uh, sympathetic inhibits emptying of the bladder. No one really wants to pee, although sometimes if that bear jumps out, you may let a little bit, a little bit loose. Um, here's your fight or flight, uh, and so on. Um, and then just some generic stuff on the brain, some embryonic development. It begins as a forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. Here you see uh, developmentally, and each region is going to develop into the, um, all the basic structures that we have of the brain. Uh, all the details of which we're not going to talk about in this class. The uh, College Board does not require that level of detail. Uh, we'll just touch on some of the main areas. Okay, the brain stem shown here is made up of the medulla oblongata here. That's the first region connected to the spinal cord. Uh, connected to that is the pons. The pons is largely for breathing. And then you have the midbrain here in the middle. The medulla is control centers for your viscera. It's kind of your, your bottom line, foundational functioning, very important. You don't have control over it. The pons also, uh, in visceral functions, largely we talk about the pons with regulating breathing, um, causing you or, or telling you to breathe. Uh, and then the midbrain is, uh, receives uh, sensory input um, and then tries to integrate it and starts to direct it into different areas. Uh, you also have some, uh, a region called the reticular formation that helps to uh, split or separate uh, and work with arousal and sleep um, and then pass the messages on to different areas uh, tying to the thalamus. It relays messages over to the thalamus which is seen here where all these arrows start from. The cerebellum, back here, this cauliflower-like structure uh, is for coordination, uh, motor coordination and uh, perception. Um, it's also involved in learning and remembering motor skills. So um, in anatomy phys, we'll actually talk about some of the ways that if this is damaged, things that uh, occur and so on. But this is the cerebellum. It's mostly tied to motor coordination and perception. The hypothalamus, important area. Uh, regulates homeostasis. It's the granddaddy gland, if you like, of all the other glands um, and helps to regulate things like feeding, fighting, running away, and also reproducing. Um, and you'll see the hypothalamus ties directly to the pituitary gland. Um, there's an anterior pituitary and a posterior pituitary and the pituitary releases hormones into the bloodstream to control a variety of other glands and the pituitary is if you like, turned on and off by the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is the major controlling mechanism uh, of that. And thus, it also plays a role in circadian rhythms and sleep-wake cycle. The cerebrum itself is the surface of the brain. Uh, the cerebral cortex has white matter uh, and, uh, and also basal nuclei, which are uh, white matter found within the gray matter. Um, and the two different hemispheres are connected in only one structure the two different uh, uh, cortexes, if you like, the surfaces, um, here with the corpus callosum, and we'll, we won't get too much into that, but that's the relay station, kind of the bridge between the two. And uh, some of you might have heard in a sight class or something where if you cut this, uh, the two hemispheres, the two sides can't communicate between each other. The thalamus, another important uh, area, this is the relay station for sensory information. So it goes um, from the midbrain uh, here, so from the medulla to midbrain, and then the midbrain will often route information to the thalamus, uh, which is shown here. Thalamus is just above the hypothalamus, of course. Here's the hypothalamus right there, and just beneath that is the thalamus. Um, and the, sorry, the hypothalamus runs this gray region from here all the way up into here. And just below that, you have the thalamus. And the thalamus is the region of the brain which will define where in the cerebral cortex the sensory information is going to go. So if it's vision, visual input, it's going to go to the occipital lobe here in the back of the brain um, versus hearing and so on. So the cerebral cortex is where sensory information gets analyzed and also motor commands are issued. There you're, you respond back with how to respond or what to do. And this is also the region where language is uh, understood and processed and spoken. Here's all the different regions of the brain. You have the frontal lobe. Uh, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe, uh, mainly just know the lobes. It's not as important that you memorize what happens in each lobe right now. Um, and as, uh, as the brain develops uh, in an embryo, you get something called lateralization where the two different sides um, begin to gain or serve different purposes and functions. Um, so you segregate them in a way so you don't uh, occupy multiple regions of the brain for doing the same thing. The left hemisphere essentially becomes very adept at language, math, and being logical, as we say. This is the logical side of the brain, the math side. Uh, 
And the right hemisphere is very good at pattern recognition um, and emotional processing. This is your emotional side, your uh, English language kind of side, not your English.